Yeah, it should, there you go. Should we record? Go ahead, my friend. All right. Uh, thank you guys uh, for jumping in. Um, before I start, I would love for us to have this not be so much of a presentation where I'm just talking the whole the all, all through, but um, for us to really talk about game engines and drones. And it's it's so exciting here to already sort of see some of the backgrounds of the people that I see on this call. And I'm excited to talk to you guys about this. So um, just a brief intro. My name is Osarajan Victory, Binobaro. Like I said earlier, I'm based here in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. And I'm the co-founder and CEO of Air AI. And Air AI is really a drone technology and software company based here in Las Vegas. And our goal is to create software that allows people to interact with drone data and other geospatial data uh, in a more fun, interactive, and immersive way, right? Uh, and we want to do this at a global scale. Uh, and our vision is to build a community of drone pilots to digitize our world and, and create a high resolution gamified environment using both drone data and other sources. So it's a very um, ambitious goal. We actually uh, emerged out of a university project, an innovation challenge here while I was doing my master's degree in architecture. Uh, just a little more background with me. I, I have a background in architecture. I'm a Pat 107 drone pilot, and I worked with a civil engineering firm and a 3D visualization firm and an architecture firm over the past six, seven years. And my role was really all around 3D modeling, 3D you know, photogrammetry, uh, 3D visualization with um, game engines, you know, Unreal, Unity, uh, Twin Motion. Uh, so we'd use those tools to really create cutting edge animations for engineering projects. So like roadways, bridges, and all kinds of simulations. So uh, as someone who used to model stuff by hand, you know, I, I model things from bridges to, to roadways, to sidewalks, to buildings. And it was really a game changer um, about four or five years ago, very first time when I created my first photogrammetry model using the, the Mavic 2 Pro. So that was that was exciting. You know, I mapped my house under uh, I think it was like 10 minutes just to create a quick model. And seeing that 3D model after processing it was a game changer for me because I, I spent hours and a lot of time um, modeling that by hand. But even taking it further, uh, bringing that data into game engines and being able to then simulate um, within it as as being has been quite eye opening, right? There's so many so many opportunities, and I'm excited to hear and see more people getting interested. And in, I think there are people very interested in game engine, very passionate about game engine. I'm an Unreal Engine fellow. I love Unreal. Unity is great, uh, but I'm just biased towards Unreal. Uh, but there is not so many people within the drone, and at least in my opinion, and the game engine uh, and gaming environment that's trying to really bridge this gap. And it's it's kind of, I don't know, it's the situation where you're like, wow, you know, I wish more people would see the possibilities because they're quite honestly endless. And it's cool to now see an ecosystem building around that on the software side, whether it's on rail, moving more towards AEC project, um, to Cesium, right? Creating SDKs in on rail and really starting to look at game engines as a tool to not just create games, but to create uh, more interactive and immersive experiences. So, and, and, and basically trying to build what they would term the fancy name of industrial metaverse. So that's why we're here. Um, I, I don't have like an official presentation. I have a couple of slides I wanted to show you guys just to get certain things uh, stimulated. I would love to hear more about just, you know, some of you guys on the call when it's ideal, Tarek. But the reason why we're talking is videos that I've been posting on the commercial drone mapping group, which, you know, it's just been amazing. The, the amount of people there, the expertise, and it's it's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about what we're building at Area AI and the opportunities that other people could tap in using game engines. So I posted the video uh, we're building a tool called the Simulated Environment for Geospatial Assets, which we call SEGA. It's really, you know, a visualization tool uh, to create more simulations, more, more advanced ways of looking at drone data. And I'm happy to share with you guys tech stack, how we plugins we're using in Unreal, how we're building it, 
our team, and most importantly, hear your feedback, you know, whether it's from a software development perspective, a 3D modeling, visualization, data capture processing perspective, a user perspective, or whatever perspective that you think could, could really be helpful. I'm excited to share as much as I can, and, and I really hope we can build a community around this, a community of gamers, a community of uh, people interested in immer immersive tech, but blending that with drones, and I think it's absolutely exciting. So that's an overview, an introduction about me, and uh, I'll throw it back to you, Terry. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Rodion, for that. Uh, I'd say, like, uh, you know, my, so you're capturing data with, uh, again, other folks also feel free to open your mics up and ask questions. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's not locked for anyone. Uh, but um, one question is, uh, uh, is my mic, mic working now? It's working. Yes. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, cool. <laughs> Or you can type in the chat. But uh, you know, so you're capturing uh, uh, the data with using uh, obviously photogrammetry, uh, and I'm uh, obviously by now obviously you're an expert in 3D modeling. So would you mind telling us how do you first create that 3D model? What software do you use? Uh, is it one of those commercial, you know, AgiSoft, MetaShape, blah blah blah, or is it open source, WebODM, etc.? How do you get to that stage first? That's a that's a good question. Um, so yeah. And just for a more understanding, yeah, you know, Sega software and Beauty on Unreal can handle photogrammetry, LiDAR, CAD, DIM. It can really handle a bunch of stuff. But answering your question, um, so we, I fly for photogrammetry. I fly the Pirate Anna AI. I love the drone. <laughs> I think it's an amazing drone. And also the fact that we're developing stuff on it. But when we capture the data, uh, primarily my 3D uh, modeling tool is Reality Capture or capturing reality reality capture by capturing reality which is now a part of the unreal engine ecosystem um i don't know that it's the best or anything as such but i think it's a really good software i've used pix4d for a couple of projects in the past i've also used web odm which i will talk to you more uh, about uh after i answer this and i think it, there's a lot of potential with web odm but yeah so it's data capture with the nfe or any drone and processing with reality capture and the reason why I use reality capture is a specific one. The reason why I use it, it's because of its um, components merging system, right? Where in reality capture, you could capture photogrammetry and process it and capture LIDAR and you could merge that data, right? Or you can merge different photogrammetry using, you know, just uh, uh, control points. So it's, it's a very, it's been a pretty cool tool. I think reality capture is doing a lot of great stuff. I know uh, there is other programs out there that does the exact same thing. So mostly it's reality capture to get that 3D model or that um, point cloud. And in reality capture, you can automatically upload to Cesium, which you can use to pull the data into Unreal, or you can bring it in natively as an FBX or OBJ or LAZ file. So that's that's really that workflow. But um, I've, been, I've been working with ODM, uh, web ODM, uh, specifically, uh, not so much because of its, you know, processing quality, which is decent, right? But uh, the ability for us to build that processing tool on top of the Unreal Engine application, right? Yeah. And then use it to scale the data capture process. Yes. So with Reality Capture, you can run one instance based on the license or, or you know, the limitation with your computer. But with WebODM and, and deploying that infrastructure on the cloud, you know, as an organization that we're trying to be uh, designating certain parts or certain places to scan, you know, distributed data capture, right? I, ODM really opens a lot of opportunities for that. We've done some large maps, we're taking that approach. So our goal is to really um, eventually have ODM running as a plugin within Unreal so we can directly process. You can do that in reality capture, but at a scale that's a little more um, with ODM and if you start looking at cluster ODM and so on and so forth. So yeah, so it's it's reality capture for the typical stuff and uh, we're looking at ODM for the, the future of what we're building to scale those maps and models. Yeah. That's that's really cool to hear because I've been playing around with well, web ODM and cluster ODM specifically and uh, parallelizing all this, you know, uh, this effort. So that's really cool to hear you guys are working. I'm hoping, uh, are you guys planning to open source that stuff back into the ODM project? 
Yes. So some of the some of the it, when you say open source, the stuff you're talking about the data or or, or what, if you if you're making modifications to the web ODM code. Yes. Uh, yes. And after yes. ODM, are you planning to push that back into the? Yep. Code? Yep. So we're gonna put that plugin into ODM and have users of ODM. You know how when you process stuff, you have this window in Open Drone Map that you can use yeah. to. So our goal is to have not really the same window, but something where you can pull that data into a more immersive environment, right? And, and you can run it on the cloud using like pixel streaming or just download the application on your own. So yeah, I mean, ODM is a great tool. Open, having it open source for others, it only just makes sense that we follow that path of letting that plugin be available to users of ODM and users of Unreal Engine. Got it. Cool. Uh, anybody else has questions uh, before we move on? Okay, I was thinking maybe, uh, uh, do you want to just, you know, you showed the video on the thing, but do you want to show it live from your end as just yeah. what it looks like? And then we can, I think that can yeah. inspire more conversations on uh, what, the, what the next thing we'll talk about. Yeah, it so. says you have to allow me share my screen. Okay. Um, so. Yeah. Settings. Here, post management, share screen. There you go. You should be able to do that now. Go ahead. All right. I will try to jump in on it now. Right. Let me know when you see it. It's coming up. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Um, so, you know, just like high level on, you know, infrastructure, this is actually our, uh, this is Unreal Editor, and I'm just in play mode. So the build would look like this. Uh, currently, this is still a work in progress. Like I explained, you know, we're still testing a lot of this stuff in house. Some of it being used by our own in house client, but we would like to deploy it and have more people uh, use it. There's a public and there's a private part. And I don't want to, this is not a conversation to sell what we do, but really to explain. So, what you're looking at is the new user interface and the viewport for our MVP. And it's, it's, fairly basic at this point honestly like uh we have a simple navigation bar to the left here um that you could use to go to different locations and you could also use to add specific views from where you want to look you know view stuff and i'll jump into some of those things earlier well, is there, a sorry is a location here that's a point where you mapped out where you have a model is that yes yes these are several locations and i think i could let me hold on. Let me do this. Uh, this is more by Google Earth, I'm guessing, or no? So this is uh, this actual base map is provided by Cesium. So you want to check Cesium Ion, and they have a plugin for Unreal that lets you bring geospatial assets and then tile it on top of your of of your of your tile. So you could really you know, have them be in the right coordinates and, and in the right location. So the project I actually um, showed in the, what's called the, the Facebook group. Yeah. It's this, it's a, basically we're trying to, we just, so with Cesium, you could pull LiDAR point cloud from Cesium uh, and stream it into the project. There's certain cases where that's, that's what you need to do. But we also wanted to be able to load LiDAR data in runtime, right? Uh, on our own, anybody can just load it. And so we recently implemented, sorry about that. We recently implemented this feature where you can import um, 3D models. So this could be a photogrammetry file or a LiDAR file, and you can import it in runtime and bring it so here. Oh, yeah. If I had a LiDAR file, this would zoom into the exact geolocation and, and uh, populate out my point cloud, right? So for now, it just loads the LiDAR file into the viewport and you kind of have to move it. But yeah, you know, because this environment has, you know, that lat longitude, latitude, altitude of every single object on the side. Yeah, eventually we want to code that so that from the LiDAR information, if there is exif or so like any kind of GPS data in there, it can pull it in to locate and put that file where it's at. So that's a that's a good question. For now, it just loads it into the viewport. And now it loads it, and then you have to drag it and put it. Yes, in. yes. But eventually, what you're talking about, Eric, is the way to go. Uh, so so far, what we have going is importing that data into the Unreal 
in real time, you know, you have that slider and you have these LIDAR um, point cloud budget. And if you have a computer that's not, you know, the best graphics card or RAM, you know, LIDAR can be quite intensive. And this is also something too, Unreal, so far, it's actually doing a pretty good job visualizing LIDAR data, which is, you know, in terms of just it being laggy and, and stuff like that, it's been good. So this is the video. I mean, you could put a little rain in here just to kind of like, uh, <laughs> show people you know some of the things that happen in game engine not that it really matters in this specific project but it might right um and i was saying even when i posted this that it's it's a thing where you could if it's a situation where you need to create maybe simulations for flooding for a place like this to see water level that's something that's better to do in unreal right you could flood this whole thing and there, there's several simulations and part of our journey of building this is to talk to different stakeholders who are working with LIDAR and construction energy, whatever, and say, hey, what would be necessary to, to do uh, or to visualize or to simulate in a tool like this? Because you honestly, as much as I don't like to say, you can almost do anything in here uh, as long as you have a, a brief and a team to, to execute on it. So this is really that um, rock LIDAR. We also have a uh, tool here where you could so as you can see, it's all work in progress. You can measure distance. You can create notes. So if you're a project manager, you have this um, scan and you're visualizing it. You wanted to put notes around each place and let people know when someone opens it, you can do it. You can also draw over it. But let's just taking distance, because this is a point cloud file, um, you can actually measure distance. Now, you don't see the point of this. Uh, our uh, distance measurement on the on the actual point cloud because we offset the visual aspect so you can see it you know it's not all lost within the point cloud but what it's happened what how it's getting these distances for every point in the point cloud uh, a mesh collision uh, collision mesh is generated so it uses the collider so you're actually like measuring from points to points you're measuring within um the the point cloud basically uh, and you can click here. The same thing applies for uh, notes and so on and so forth. In terms of walking, I think you guys have seen this as well. This is the uh, uh, kind of like a, a little pretty metahuman avatar. Um, those of you guys that work with Unreal, you know about metahumans. This is hyper realistic uh, avatars that have been created by you know Unreal, and you could do some really really amazing stuff. So, you know, pushing that visual fidelity, like I had said earlier, we try to create this avatar in here that, you know, right now the only animation is to basically walk and jump, uh, but eventually, you know, we wanna put more custom an animations into this, uh, you know, able to lift something, able to get into a car and drive around a construction site and see what's being built in that construction site, right? Um, again, it's like, I see this through the lens of GTA, <laughs> like Fortnite, um, and so on and so forth. So I think the avatar concept, you know, obviously most LIDAR, you look at it from, you know, an aerial view or you're measuring with CAD and so on and so forth. But this is, you can bring LIDAR with RGB data. And if it's really high quality, you know, that's something that you can see the textures and see all kinds of information associated with, with that LIDAR. So I think this ground view, really helps you know if you wanted to start doing inspection without necessarily have to be have your foot on the ground and you still want to get that human level uh view of it another thing we're looking at implementing here is the only thing we're trying to implement here is the um vr view where you put on a vr headset and you can walk around this ingo is asking does the avatar walk on the point cloud or did you define it works on the point cloud so the same logic that we use to take measurements so yeah the same logic that we use to take the same measurements for you know from the lidar point cloud is what we use to generate the collisions so these are all i mean you could see for instance right like you cannot you know you cannot walk through here all of these colliders are actually they're not just you know simple collisions where you know they're they're, they're there are collisions that actually work with the point cloud. So that's how that's how we're generating that collision. And that's a that's a good question. So that's 
mostly uh, it for now. I mean, and you can also fly to different uh, projects. Um, let me let me go review. Um, there's several projects and you know and eventually we want to be able to just drag that avatar and throw it in there but now we're coordinating this um like coordinating the the navigation so it's easier for people to to navigate i'm gonna go to kind of like um a construction site so you guys see some of the construction stuff that we've done it takes a minute to load here and so you know with the lidar i was showing earlier that has that's like lidar that's in, imported directly from the laz what you're looking at is it's more something that's streamed in here right this is more like streamed information and but it's still a drone photogrammetry this is a drone photogrammetry mesh all of these are actually drone 3d photogrammetry mesh and what i didn't have shown on that other project are these embedded tags these embedded tags let you see imagery that you know you can embed imagery and videos and so on and so forth right so you could you know go for instance uh, this is early on in the construction to the left and later down the road to the right and it's a think about this as evolving to become like a calendar system where you're you're in within the model and if you're doing recurrent scan of a specific construction site in that digital twin model you could flip through and just with imagery you can see the imagery of the entire site or specific parts of the site uh and how things have developed over time you can do the exact same thing with 3d models too like you could you could see different 3d models uh, that that have been created over time and so on and so forth uh we have some stuff like this you can see all of that another thing that i wanted to see uh speak to you guys here is you know the ability to start to use other um other third-party solution or even some in-house solution to analyze some of these data so i don't know if you guys have ever heard of the company called civedia uh they provide computer vision algorithms uh, you know, for object detection, tracking, and so on and so forth. And we've we've been able to test some of it. It's not available in this build, but we're working on test some of their algorithms where, so within this model, and I think I even have, hold on, I might have that. Let me see if this is something I could pull up real quick. So within this model, you have all kinds of, um, you know, like items. I'll give you an example, you know, it's just, let me try to see. You have all kinds of items that needs to be counted, right? All like taking account for account of, you know, you have all these tractors, you have these uh, cars. In fact, the reason why I'm bringing this up is when I did this scan, the, while I was scanning the site, there was someone who was just, who just finished, um, counting everything on site so the guy was being paid basically to go around the site and account for every single um equipment on site and making sure that they're at the location and going home and it took you know he said it would take him several hours you know at least you know, but for a site like this it's smaller maybe under an hour but something bigger if this if there is um it, it, complexity of side more equipment you you would you, you could tell how dangerous that is too it's not just a matter of uh the time that you spend counting stuff so the video i was uh talking to you guys the company we're talking to you guys about uh Siberia, is we can use the ai algorithms to identify some of these objects and what we're what's being identified right now is not even imagery this is this is the actual 3d model um as you can see it's tagging cars you know giving them a number a name blah 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 it's not perfect you could still see it's recognizing some objects but with time as you stabilize the image it's able to differentiate what really is a car and what is not but you know our goal is you know with time hopefully we can you know, incorporate these tools within um on rail 
because uh, they, they they do have you know that as you can that pipeline and be able to use it to analyze data and provide feedback to our clients so when you capture your data and, and you wanted to quickly know what's on site what's what's missing you could quickly run that analysis and get you know a spreadsheet or or anything along that line that helps you better understand um the projects so those are those are just uh some of the things um let me see if I have any other interesting. Uh, uh, just a question over here for this yeah. example. Yeah. Is, is this photogrammetry or LIDAR? Yes, this is photogrammetry. Uh, you might have missed it earlier. Yeah, this is photogrammetry. Yeah. This is all done. Um, this was captured using the Pirate Anna AI. And it's, and like I was saying, you could see that it actually is streaming the data. Like the further you go out, the less the resolution is, the more you walk in. The yeah, better yeah. that resolution is. That's because we're actually streaming this through Cesium. Um, because Cesium, that's basically your plugin, the streaming data info on rail, so that you you're not running all of that computing in local memory. But now we can pull data through Cesium and we can also pull a local file. Where this is good is if you have a large um like a contest model that you didn't want to bulk down the application, you can load through Cesium and as you scan your daily scans you could uh, then bring that and overlay it on, on, on top of this uh, information. Okay, so uh, sorry, one more question, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, sorry for being a devil's advocate here, but- No, uh, man, I love it. So if you, let's say, so if we could you scroll back upwards all the way out? So oh, you have oh, this oh, model. Oh, so you have this model that you placed manually onto uh, the earth somewhere, right? Yeah. Uh, and then, so, uh my question here is okay so you're you're doing some tagging some ai based uh, uh object detection of some sort a right? mm -hmm. 3d model or mosaic but you could do that without the real unreal engine or you know you could do that independent of uh this unreal setup and all that so where does the unreal setup where is that advantage coming in because uh, you could you could do this in web odm and have everything tapped up as a point cloud or yeah. whatever so where's the advantage we see here with so i think the advantage in my opinion there are several one is having that be a part of the immersive experience right uh, if you are running this in web odm you could get very similar results you know in terms of that data you know the spreadsheet that comes out of it what's been analyzed it's going to be quite similar but once you bring it into the Unreal Engine, you can start to tie that analysis and the data from that analysis to everything else that's built within Unreal, right? Um, I'll give you an example, for instance. Yeah. If we yeah. are on a construction site like this, we're able to identify uh, equipment and all that kind of stuff within Unreal. That data can be fed within Unreal Engine to place specific assets within that location of what has been uh analyzed so this is maybe the construction site is not the best but uh, i'll give an example with let's say um a landscape project a park right the park you have a hundred trees you've scanned it in lidar or uh, in photogrammetry and now you have that data guess what it's if you're going to use that data to maybe design a video game or design a building it's really heavy in that raw format, right? And if you want to use it for visualization, it yeah. can be heavy. So by analyzing, so let's say you 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 get that scene, you you counting the trees, the vegetation, the roads, the 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 stripes, whatever. Now with procedural modeling in Unreal, you feed all of that information back in Unreal. And if you generated a cleaner mesh, a cleaner scene, right, mm -hmm. at a very high level, or well, that's just for asset generation, right? I mean. It, it, as long as that data has been pulled, you can then use it to affect other things that are within the Unreal Engine, whether yeah, it's the actually, system, whether it's the data. Does that make sense? I, I see. So uh, this is not point cloud I'm saying. This is Unreal generated data from a point cloud or from a photogrammetry. It's it's Unreal assets, right? In Unreal's data format. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. this is this is a, a U asset. This is an Unreal asset as it is in the game well this is not this is actually uh, a cesium streamed asset but this was from a drone fbx file right this is not 3d model let me see if i could find something where we created a cad 
out of the unreal yes i think i found something just so you're know. almost you're using unreal as a, almost a realistic storage engine for your assets yep basically yeah so um this is just like a random example uh, exist existing site and this is a cad model by the way this building uh is a cad model and you could switch different options and so on and so forth but the point here i was trying to make with that analysis there's there's a lot of stuff going on it, with this we're visualizing this is a point cloud basically um you can see that it's a point cloud but you know with those analysis that we're doing we could start to okay now we we point cloud classification you can classify a wall you can classify um a door you can classify a road you can classify a sidewalk those classification information can be broadened into unreal you know procedural modeling to then model the scene right uh to remodel the scene and 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 this way is the way i feel like we can start creating large scale worlds from drone data that don't all look like point cloud with so much noise and again this is this is a little further away so we're we're not um uh, you know all developed when it comes to getting all of that analysis into the unreal engine is video but that's where we're we're headed that's where we want to go at least at least because i mean the, the tech is there <laughs> right it's about spending the time to develop it and I, I mean as a game designer i think they will get it right if you if this is not clean for a game asset or even some high quality visualization or yeah. certain immersive projects when yeah. you're at ground level it can look a little messy but being able to auto classify the point cloud and generate native on real assets out of that or use it to affect simulations or other game mechanics that happens within the game I, I i think that's a game changer that's something you would not be able to do by running the same analysis outside of unreal does that make sense that makes sense that makes sense. i can uh, so I, I understand it from the perspective of gaming you want to bring real time real world assets into here you, you know using drones and stuff and you're bringing these assets into here do you uh, and uh, you know you're talking about other users as well i think you and also ingo are talking about uh, you know uh, training making drone training better things like that uh, so my in my head what i'm trying to do uh, like uh, because this is the first time i'm seeing that seeing this i'm i'm trying to understand what is the use case what is the business use case that mm -hmm. we're trying to that uh, you know you're trying to solve what are the business use cases that we can target with this sort of thing uh that's a that's a very good point uh so it's 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 really about digital twin yes. creation yep. right it's, yep. it's about asset management in-house and visualizing that assets at a scale at at the level of um visual fidelity that you will probably not find elsewhere so the business use i'll say for instance if you are a telecommunication company or even a large construction company and you have assets across the country or across the world right you have 10 construction projects across north south east west coast america and all of those products has to be inspected or you know like site visit has to be done you have a limited amount of uh project managers and you have a limited amount of budget to send them around the country to go often to see what's happening and this is real world scenarios where people reach out to us about this stuff right you have a project in hawaii we're based in atlanta we can be out there can we capture drone data so that we can see and not just see but we also immerse ourselves and walk around the site so it's a tool for such a company to not just be able to see one project, but see a multitude of projects within the same environment in real time, right? Uh, so that real time uh, uh, capabilities that Unreal brings, I think is at that scale is what I don't see other competitors out there. It's almost like you get to view a product one at a time. Here it's sort of similar, but it's still, you don't have to, you can show CAD, you can show point cloud, you can show photogrammetry mesh within the same location, right? And you can immerse yourself in there and walk around it. So that's just for like construction. 
I'll give you um, another example. I was at Geo Week in Denver uh, two months ago or so, and I met with another drone pilot, and all, all he does is um, pipeline inspections, right? And, and you know, the pipelines, they go miles and miles and miles. And so when I pulled this up and we were talking, and he was like, that is crazy because what they typically do is they create an auto mosaic or a 3D model and they zoom into it like this to like see any things like they have to zoom in through um, like just m miles and miles. And there are all ways to do things. But from what he was telling me, you know, being able to they you know, did a test, they've been able to load in that pipeline information in, in a geospatial environment and throw that avatar in there. You could do that inspection like you were there, right? Now you're bringing that site back home. Yeah, you yeah. could do this with WebODM, but that level of immersion and that eye level, person level, VR level, turning stuff on, running all kinds of, you know, uh, interactive, uh, 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 kind of a, a interactive um, features in here is, is something that will be really hard to build in, outside a game engine so yeah. that's 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 kind of like the business case is that um immersion being able to consolidate your digital assets all in one place and that gives you a lot of opportunities in terms of how you are also analyzing those assets and how you're distributing it and how your team is assessing it right um another another person a civil engineer for a very big uh major civil engineering company that i met in denver was talking about working in a project that's a billion dollar project and it's a it's like it's like a massive project right and being able to again capture that data with a drone it's not just capturing the data it's like how you get insights from it now your stakeholders they're all in one room or in stakeholders doesn't even have to be owners it could be people working on site right that daily meeting that you have on the construction site sort of you know in addition to bringing out those 2d plans they already always have a TV in those caravans anyway. You know, say, hey, what did we do last year, yesterday? And let's see. Well, the drone captured that data. Boom, you put it on SIGA and you, you overlay your CAD plans, whatever, on top of it. But, you know, the manager is not quite impressed with what's going on with these cones. And you can go there, you can throw the avatar in there and see that eye level. So I think, you know, it, 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 it's there is the gaming part of also just like at least for the public version of our library where we want to scan swaths of land and then create cleaner mesh that can just be offset sitting anywhere for people to create their own video games or create their own experiences right um i'll give you i'll quickly and this is this is something that's very very uh let me see if i could go there yeah, no, just while you're showing this, this totally makes sense now. Uh, you know, I, I was thinking the very simple use case, right? When you have a 50-mile corridor, right? A yeah. 50 mile pipeline corridor or something. Yeah. Uh, if you want to load that up into WebODM, that's a long last file. Of big, will yep. you, first of all, will you be able to load it up? Or exactly. Something like that. And secondly, how do you navigate something like that without having to navigate chunks, right? Chunk one, mm -hmm. chunk two, chunk three, yep. chunk four. That's not nice. I don't want that. I yeah. want something like a, where I can go and walk through it or fly through it with a helicopter, and it's just streaming the data, and I'm looking at exactly where I need to be, and that's what this game engine provides, right? It gives you that immersive, uh, that immersive, uh, immersive feeling where you are inside your data and you're looking at it right there versus you have sections and chunks that you need to look at this building, then go load another project, look into a different building. That exactly. immersive map is lost. Exactly. And this is where, and for those that are um, familiar with game engines, this is where Unreal excites me a lot. So Unreal has something called Nanite. It's it's just kind of like a level of detail technology that lets you load literally billions of polygons, right? You, you just won't be able to, even Unity cannot handle some of those things uh, that you can. I'll give you an example. This is, the entire arts district of downtown Las Vegas that we how many how many acres how many acres roughly oh uh, this is like two hundred acres okay okay um but again it's there's a, a lot of buildings here you know captured this over a period of time but ODM could not open this mesh you know like it just could not like it would just crash yeah. um, what else could not open it Rhino could not open it 3DX Max could not open it 
your common 3D software programs that uh, Blender could not open it. It was it was just a big model. They can you would have to split it into chunks and bring exactly. it in there. Exactly. But by the time you do that, it's like that's a lot of time wasted to split into chunks. Yeah. And sometimes those chunks they don't fall in place like you want them to, or sometimes they have creases. Yeah. And it's just by the time you load 50 of those in there, Blender is like you can't even move it around. Yeah. But with yeah. Unreal, uh, you have uh, you know you really have nanite and man you could have we have a lot of data in here basically and i can only see that going and go going higher and going higher another thing we don't know it's the lod system as whatever you're not looking at it doesn't it doesn't bug the memory right it, you know it's really good at showing you that's really what mostly nana does basically it gives you a level of detail view that yeah you can see it at this level the mesh looks like it's not so high res but as i jump in you could see some things will load and you can start to even see like this is the the sign on the wall how did you get the sign that's amazing sorry ingo has a question but yes cool. Luke, go ahead no 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 i, I was just uh, yeah it's very interesting and uh, um yes i wonder if it's it's also um must be very cool if you if you um watch watch us scene the scene by uh, an oculus rift or something yes i mean i mean that that must be completely immersive and and even for the clients must be pretty cool if they just have the data put on an oculus rift and then they have every then they are inside the scene i mean it it must be there must be an interest i think on the market Absolutely. i don't know so cesium uh, and this is uh, uh this is something that you're going to see uh and i'm happy to talk to more of you guys but cesium which has that feature you can literally and i have an oculus too uh oculus quest uh meta quest whatever they call it now um so yeah you can you can immerse yourself in here as a vr right now the navigation mode we have is that flying around and the avatar the next navigation is going to be vr and i think that's 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 a lot of um in fact, I was just talking to someone this week who's really interested in that. And they want, because now, because you can have CAD models in here, you know, you can bring files from Twin Motion. You know, if you, if you know Twin Motion, it's a 3D visualization tool that's built in Unreal. If you've an architect, engineer, whatever, you design a project and it looks really cool, you're putting all these cool visualization effects and you bring it into Unreal because you already have that data in any ways. And now that data is there, the contest, which has been scanned by a drone, LIDAR, photogrammetry, or whatever, is also there. And you jump into VR, you're not only able to see the design project, which is typically the case, you're also able to see it in context of other things. You're able to see how the project does with lighting and all kinds of things. So that's that's a great that's a great point, Ingo. And uh I don't I, I think I you I saw you putting some information more about your background in gaming uh, uh, engines and 3D visualization. Uh, I'm really excited to learn more about you and uh, uh, nerd out more on this with you. Uh, but that's VR here is cool. With VR though, we need to um, be very mindful as to you know the memory and and just capabilities in terms of you know the frames. You know if it's not looking good, if you're not getting what like 90 frames, uh, 120 or something like that, it, you know VR can start getting very laggy. But like I said, because these data sets some of them not all uh because they're being streamed right so if i go closer it's not in memory uh like you know so so you could really have a huge data set that's streamed in right it's streamed into the application because it's not default then you can really have that immersive experience yes please you don't have to raise your hand uh ingo please uh, feel free to just go I think you had your hands raised. Ingo, you're, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Sorry. Um, Victor, yes, I'm, I'm interested to, uh, what kind of uh, computer you are using right now. So what graphic board and memory size and, and CPU? 10,000. Yeah, uh, so, OK, so those of you don't think we started this way. So I. I've been working on this for, for 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 over a year now, just developing on this, and we did all our development. I ran it on uh, uh, 2070, 
um, back then. But I just upgraded to a 4090. <laughs> I just got a 4090 like a month ago, uh, RTX 4090. So, you know, ray tracing is really cool, uh, amazing. And I run a 64 gigabyte RAM, you know, motherboard. Um, I think the processor, I mean, I could literally pull. So it's nothing, it. nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Nothing no, no, it's crazy. and again, I think I don't have. Uh, I could, uh, I could pull this up, but the goal here is that you, you will be able to download this, you know, as a exe file and run it on your computer, but also be able to uh, run it on the web using pixel streaming technology. That is which cool. Is which is 3D streaming, yeah. Well, obviously, as a as a as a as a more premium fee, because you kind of have to pay for that compute compute power, yeah. or you use your own servers to to run it. So we have this running on the web using yeah. Pixel Streaming Tech. Uh, you could run it on the web browser on your phone, on your iPad, and on the computer. Makes making it really platform agnostic. So it's it's a it's a it's a different experience. I mean, uh, on the web, but yeah. I eventually want to be able to run this we have shout out to nvidia uh we got accepted into the uh, inception program so we've got some credits on nvidia uh to really run you know game engine software and the cloud gpus so you know still measuring what that would look like so we're making it uh, a premium feature because we just put it out there you know it, it, it we don't it, it will get expensive real quick gpu right. power is expensive but you know if you're having a premium project you know you, all you need is to send a link to your client and and they jump in here and they could get all of that experience on their web browser now we could use webgl which is not that uh intensive as pixel streaming but it's there, there's a lot of limitation as to how you know how much you can package that you know uh, the, the experience for the client or pixel streaming you could do everything all you really need to care about is the GPU that's going to be running on the cloud and, and that streaming latency and, and so on and so forth. But yeah, eventually full launch, which we want to have, we want to have like a public beta launch where, you know, guys like you guys could jump in here and start using some of this stuff. You can right now actually use this for stuff, uh, but we need to get a couple of things done, like aggregating the information within the scene and saving that as a file type. Uh, right and just like so that you can load it like you would a video game we think these are the next two things we really want to get it done so that people who use the application can open it load stuff use all of the features and save it and that will make it available for others to use yeah. and then we can implement some of the other features that we want yeah yeah you know this is so cool like uh one of the projects that i'm looking at is uh, in the future is mapping the city of in Dhaka, Bangladesh, so mapping the city center. So now the city is about 100 and, you know, 100 and something square, you know, it's it's a big city, right? So now the question is, when you do this mapping, how do you put all these chunks together? <laughs> you, know, you create a yeah. section, what is, what is that storage system, which I'll be using to put all these chunks together and the, that I'll provide for the client to use. So one obviously is if I build all these things, you know, something big like SV or something like that, that might be able to hold these things, but uh, I think the power that you you show here is, you know, some sh some sections could be photogrammetry, some sections could be lidar, some sections could be CAD files, and you're putting all these assets together in one spot, uh, and you're seamlessly traversing and viewing this environment as it's getting built or as it's getting updated, uh, in in one setting in one space with. Obviously, you don't need the best CPU, GPU, etc. A normal, regular, decent computer can handle. I think that's uh, the power of navigating that. And then obviously then tagging, searching, AI stuff that you add to it would be super powerful, I think. It's just, it's a whole different interface for really uh, uh, GIS products, as you're saying, right? For these things. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. And, and that was a really good comment you made initially around storage for so many reasons storage as can you really yeah this is the whole city of las vegas if we have all of that data how would the application handle it storage, it. yeah how would they stream it how would they give yeah, how would you handle it also security where is that data sitting who has access to it and by running the application in runtime can i hack it and download all of that data like what are those concerns so yeah. we you know that data security data storage scalability 
is one of the things that keeps us awake at night. But the cool thing about Unreal is that we don't have to have all of that data sitting within the application, mm -hmm. right? It can always be drawn in from a location, whether it's a GCS server where some of them is staying. Again, boiling back to that conversation of ODM. Um, so with ODM now, you know, when you process, if you've launched ODM on AWS using cluster ODM, or if you've launched it on one of these web services, you know you can always have a container that has that information after it's processed, right? You always have that AWS container. Now, guess what? In Unreal, you can pull that information from that container, right? So you process that data in the web and you can pull it into Unreal when you need, right? And so, yeah, go ahead. So you're using WebODM as the source of truth for the data? Or what are you, where are you using WebODM for in this, this piece? Well, eventually, WebODM is just going to be playing the role of reality capture or meta shape or any of these photogrammetry tool, right? But it's built on top of Unreal because they made it open, right? And it does the processing on the cloud. So you would still use WebODM like you use WebODM, but when it gets to time when you need to look at that data, it just passes it into Unreal and passes it into this application so on web odm is just going to be your good old photogrammetry software and uh, which you with that logic you can still look at look for an open source lidar software that you could use to process lidar data and put in hopefully maybe rock cloud at some point maybe we can work with rock cloud when they process the data they have a really amazing tool um where you know you can take a lot of measurement but if they wanted to add where it's like oh hey you know you can add this button and you take this tool into this uh platform and now this is what you do with it uh, with lidar so like the the idea the reason why i'm excited about odm and photogrammetry is that scalability like i said um we this application is being built to have a private version and a public version and right? the private version is more for like you know in clients in-house work where you have your own team only have access to that data but eventually we want a marketplace and, and I think this is really where there's going to be a lot of opportunities. It gives drone pilots or any geospatial data collector a place to sell their data. Um, and, and not just to sell it, but to sell it to, or to put it in a place where other people can access it, you know, we can process it, get a bunch of information out of that, and also give that as insights to other clients. So if you happen to live in Florida, you captured a really nice neighborhood or a nice monument or whatever yeah you could throw it on sketchfab but you know in a more immersive application like this it's already ready and we can maybe just export it into on real marketplace and now you're giving um game designers assets to work with or yeah. whoever you know so Very many cool. different assets so that's really the reason why we think we need to bring um web odm and you you're talking about bangladesh and i'm from nigeria uh, in Vegas, you have 20 drone pilots. They have all of their um, areas designated to them. You go out there, you capture that data, you bring it into uh, web ODM, cluster ODM, whatever. You're not limited to your 64 gigabyte RAM because it's running on AWS and it's scalable. You know, you can yeah. always request more. Yeah, parallel processing, yeah. Yeah, you can yeah. process all of that and have that data a lot faster than you would go capture the data and bring because reality capture can can only I don't think you can visualize more than 40 million points in reality capture even with a RTX 4090 and a 64 gigabyte RAM. So I, I, I don't, yeah, you know, WebODM is not that widely used, um, but I think there's a lot of potential with that too. Uh, so you're saying, uh, just to summarize, you're seeing WebODM still as the processing layer processing. Uh, 3D models or other stuff, and then you import from WebODM into Unreal. Or yeah. it, uh, th there's a seamless transition between WebODM deliverables and the Unreal engine and visualization. Yes, yes. Makes sense. This is really cool, man. I Man, dude, if you want even an alpha tester, let me know, man. <laughs> yeah, I want. I want it. Okay. I was a little, I, I get a little, um, I don't know what's the word, uh, kind of just like, I'm not sure if it's ready. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not imposter syndrome. I don't know if I want to share this. I don't know if. Yeah, no, no, no. First of all, 
But yeah, I would love to. And and thank you, Tarek. I really appreciate you saying, hey, let's talk about this. And you can tell I'm excited about the tech. Uh, it's not about putting something out there as fast as possible. For me, it's really, you know, I would love to talk to people who not only see how it can be used, mm. but how it can be developed better. Yeah, you know, yeah. like what, and, I'm, and I really appreciate the reception I've gotten from the, the that group. You know, you guys were the one who recommended, hey, you know, we should start taking measurements. Next thing we want to get in here is, so, you know, that photogrammetry, when you load photogrammetry, that first step, when it aligns all the images and yeah. tells you where they're at. So yeah. we want to be able to have that import where you just load those images. It doesn't process the data, but it just shows you an outline and it shows you where all the images are at and you can click the image and you can look at, we're currently working on that right now. So that way you can see the data that has been processed and you can see the data that was used to capture it. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, we want, you know, happy to provide this for anybody currently in the call uh, that wants to act as a, uh, alpha tester or anything like that. And you test it, see if it works for anything you're working on, get used to the interface, um, recommend features um, that we can use to build this further. We're, we're a small team, but we're, we're getting bigger. Uh, so hopefully these things will move on a lot, a lot faster. But uh, yeah, this is our little, our little project. And I'm, I'm really excited to uh, share it with anyone who wants to jump into it and, and start playing with it. And also, you know, if you want to jump into Unreal Engine and, and development, uh, if you have any interest along the line, please reach out. Uh, I'm happy to just walk you through it, uh, whether it's, you see a way to contribute to the project or because some of this is going to be open source so we we're, we're happy to have that conversation and and so yeah very good uh maybe i can suggest one thing for the folks who are in this call if okay. you could send me an email then uh, all of us we could uh, share each other's emails right so uh yeah. you have my email or what uh instead of posting it maybe in a public channel so if you don't if you don't if you don't want to post your email in the public Facebook channel, just send it to me and then I'll share it across just the folks in this call right here, the five folks. And I'll, and I'll put mine in there. So that's our, so feel free to shoot me anything. Um, I'm happy. Um, spam is fine. <laughs> <laughs> this is really, really cool. Man. I'm really, I'm really impressed and I can, I can really see where you guys are going and, uh, uh, thank you for presenting that. That was I, I know Robert and oh, uh, I was gonna pick you guys' brain real quick around uh, yeah. and this is um I think someone it was Han, someone else was talking about uh the pirate and of AI SDK, which is not what's running here, but uh we're we're talking to certain people about so let me quickly run this up. One of the things that I struggled with earlier in my career was when I get my when I got my pod 107. Yeah, I was working as an engineer. I knew exactly what to use the drone for, you know, photogrammetry and stuff. But oftentimes there's that disconnect between getting the drone license and knowing how to properly use the drone in a specific field, right? So this is just like something that I've been playing with. Um, what I was trying to do here is to sort of mimic waypoints how waypoints the idea of waypoints it's very easy you don't need an immersive application to really explain it but sometimes there are certain complex things that you would need to show here so when you're looking at this is actually a mesh that was created a photogrammetry mesh that was created using the anafi ai um and i put it into unreal and i'm you know put this drone and these are all waypoints this is kind of like show people hey this is how the drone flies uh for uh you know a typical waypoint file right but eventually we want to use this again this is uh it's called a drone awareness and reality based uh training simulator darts um eventually using it to train you know there's vr how to fly a drone without necessarily flying the drone in those risky sites so say for instance just like we have this construction site, we could also have a power line in here, right? The real world scan power line or 3D models power line. And we could use the, the Unreal Engine features and game mechanics to explain how you would capture a power line, right? And that becomes training. And Tariq, I know you were, you were saying earlier, and, and instead of just building arbitrary simulators, 
one of the reasons I love Parrot and, and their SDK is that they've opened, they also, they have something called Sphinx and they do all of the simulations for the ANAP AI in Unreal Engine. So you can simulate the drone sensor, the drone telemetry data, every single thing the drone does in real life, you can simulate it in here. So we were working, digging into that SDK to start to use it to explain complex missions. Okay. Especially, I think uh, this, I see some power in this specifically in training. So let's say in Bangladesh, right? So yeah. Bangladesh drone industry is fairly in, it's in an infancy, right? And so you have people who are crashing a lot of very expensive drones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, one thing, obviously training aspect is great. Uh, not only, you know, you can, obviously you can, uh, if you look at flight planning, right? Our whole thing is flight planning. If you look at flight planning, a through 2D flight plan and a 3D flight plan, which is immersed where you can see the height, you can see how height affects uh, your capture and things like yes. that. You totally yes. And you know, you can look at this and the next step would be, why would you not build a immersive flight planning software from this? Bro, <laughs> so so it's because of the way the scope is happening. Uh, we're exposed where, you know, high level information can go to the, but you know, we're trying to build this for a group of students to, to, to be job ready when they get their part 107, right? But we agree, um, I mean, fire services, right? Uh, using this as a tool to actually plan those complex missions. And we're gonna, we're gonna. I know Skyview has this AR thing that's going on, uh, 3D yes. scan where you know the drone captures the area first and then use it to plan the mission. That's really cool. Now, for more advanced missions where you have a computer screen at the back of your truck or whatever, like you just said, like you're now able to create way more complex fly paths for that drone, or you could go out there and scan at a very high level, capture the whole thing, and bring that data. You know, just like you would do terrain following flight, bring that data that you've scanned, bring it in here, and now you need to plan a more intricate flight path to capture that. So it's 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 why I'm excited about the part of AI, and I'm begging Skydio, if you guys are listening, please create a really comprehensive SDK. Um, software, in my opinion, is the future of the drone industry. Um, those things are flying robots. It's the software that runs them that makes them incredible. So you know as as they open that to the developer uh, uh ecosystem that's beyond what they have in their own team i think people would create things that you know they they probably would not have the bandwidth or have even imagined i mean you think about if if iphone was only limited to the apps that were created by apple you know we wouldn't have some of these cool tools that we have today so yeah, yeah excited to uh just obviously you can see we're juggling we're doing some uh, services, data capture work, but we're also building this software along with that. But this tool, this specific uh, simulator to is something that really excites me because we're building it for the Oculus Quest. So you would be able to put on that VR headset, hold the VR um, controllers, and boom, you have your drone. And you could fly that drone into a power line and not not have to pay out fifty thousand dollar insurance uh for that so it's it's a safety thing genuinely and, yeah. and i'm excited to talk to you guys i hope we can have more of this calls and really just nerd out not specifically about what we build or if anyone else is working on anything but build a community around immersive tech and drone tech for for this let's 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 talk about it later on maybe on facebook or whatever we can talk about uh uh you know more of these tech discussions or maybe immersive or other stuff and just have people showcase their work and ideas and uh you know work through this because so my background myself i'm a software engineer right so nice. uh, i love the stuff that you're doing it's it just sounds so cool obviously yeah the you know drone is one thing but really the magic is the software right so uh, yeah absolutely and i'm i'm excited i'm excited to be talking to more uh software engineers i know you guys probably have way more brain that I, that I do. Uh, but yeah, it's, again, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, we're getting fired a lot, as you know, recently. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you know, it's, it's an incentive. It's an incentive for us to create the next generation of tech. You know, you uh, I think it's it's just an exciting time to be in the drone industry. There's a lot of people doing all kinds of stuff, yeah. uh, but we we cannot build in a silo. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I I, see, I guess it's also the, the nature of the competitiveness. You know, some people are quite. I'm not quite sure if I want to tell this person, but I want to work with this person. And I'm like, man, let's just let's just all win. You know, let's really create some amazing tech that the next generation will see 
again, like one of the things that excites me is like, I, you know, I design buildings and all that stuff. And I'm like, going to college, when, you, when, you, when I needed to create a building, I go on Google Earth and it's six months old, the data is not right, I can't access the 3D model. Now I have to draft everything by hand. This is time I could be using to design, right? The, the idea that someone in the near future from what we're building hopefully can go anywhere around the city and download a very high resolution mesh and a cleaner mesh and then focus on design, it, you know, you give people back their time. So those are the kind of things that are exciting me as to who yeah. could potentially use this tech. Yeah. Uh, but let's start from uh, doing more alpha tests and having more of this conversation. And, and I hope I can share more and learn more from you guys. And thank for you sure. for jumping on the call. Hey, thank you guys for all coming in. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording here. Uh, stop recording.